Hi there. This week's chapter from Dr. Victoria Rose Bloom's Field Notes Journal is a maple leaf. Maple trees are native of Japan and China, and there are over 130 species. The oldest known fossil of the genus Acer was described from a single leaf found in Alaska from the lower Pelocene. Their seeds are called Samaras and have been found in rocks as old as 66 million years. Japanese maple trees have been considered a symbol of grace personified by many Asian cultures for hundreds of years. Associated with peace and serenity of the world's elements, Japanese maple trees represent balance and practicality and are called kito in the Japanese language, which means calm, rest, or at peace. Samaras are the seeds and are highly specialized forms of flying fruits. And yes, you can eat the seeds. Some species of trees produce these for the dispersal of their seeds in their environment. The flight of a Samara is always a highly elaborated form of mechanical motion and an excellent opportunity for application of both intermediate and analytical mechanics to a natural phenomenon. A Samara is sometimes called a key and is often referred to as a wingnut, helicopter, whirlybird, whirligig, polynose, or in the north of England, a spinning jenny. I found this haiku in the book and wanted to share it with you. Dr. V says she was inspired to pin this little haiku while traveling Japan one autumn. It was written in her field notes journal. Wings of Samara spin in bright blue autumn sky. I paint their red leaves. This tree passes a message to us as humans. It means that we need to be patient at all times. We do not need to hurry to reach that position that we want to attain in life and we should be careful and relaxed. Next autumn, make time to throw some Samara up in the air and watch them float back to Earth. Bye-bye. Hello, this is Vicki Ross. Thanks for stopping in for another episode of Dr. Victoria Rose Bloom's Field Notes Journal. I'm starting off today in my Arteza. Mm -hmm. Acid free, spiral browned, wet and dry, mixed media pad, premium. And the paper is pretty darn good for watercolor. It's great for mixed media. I'm sure it has cellulose in it instead of all cotton, but that's okay. This is um, <coughs> this is where you practice. having a lot of fun with this. Um, I hope you guys are playing along. I'm going to paint this maple leaf because we just heard from Dr. V that that it was fall where she is. And I do believe she's in her London studio. And outside some glass French doors is a cold, blustery Winnie the Pooh day. And it's wet, damp. The leaves are falling. They're on the trees. There are reds and oranges and browns. And so she decided that today would be a good day to stay in and study one of the leaves that had fallen on the concrete outside her door. So just a rough sketch here. I'm drawing an outline. You could also draw it with... <clears throat> um, with shapes like the center would be a an oval with a point on either end and then draw two of those on the sides and a small one at the bottom on each side. I'm going to use my pocket painter mini palette today. It's so handy just to have right where I want to grab it all the time. It is beautifully designed. 
Um, it has a small water container and it has um, a pallet that slides on either end. <clears throat> so you have four spaces to mix colors and you have room for a little water. Or you can use it for a big puddle of water if you're doing a wash. You can either use a wet paintbrush and drop clear water into each each little pan, or you can use what I'm doing here using a, uh, I knew I'd forget the name of it. It's a little squeezy thing that holds water. It is called Pipette. Pipette. <clears throat> I like my Pipette. You can buy them on AliExpress for next to nothing, probably Amazon as well. I think you get 50 or 100 in a package for a couple bucks. I'm going to use my silver brush. Let me see that again. I believe it's a silver brush, probably size 6. <clears throat> We will see. I'm messing with my phone now. Um, I'm doing a voiceover on this because occasionally I like to paint with my music and get in the zone. And that's what I did with this video. So forgive me if I sound stilted. I'm mixing up a phthalo green with an ultramarine. This is um, Daniel Smith's Primaries palette. Excellent, excellent way to get started. It has a warm and a cool yellow, a warm and a cool red, and a warm and a cool blue. And that will allow you to mix almost any color that you want. <clears throat> I'm playing with the mixture now to see what happens. I want it to be close. Well, you know, you always, when you're looking at a photograph, you always want to try to match it, even though that's pretty impossible. And I just want you new artists to understand that the photograph is just there for your reference. Um, you're not going to match a photo exactly, nor should you really want to. That would make you a hyper-realist. Might as well just take a picture and hang it on your wall. <clears throat> I'm doing a negative painting technique here where I'm painting the background, not the leaf. I'm painting the... Uh, that's negative painting. It's positive painting if I painted the leaf first. Now this sketchbook is where I play. So I've got a real close color there. The Daniel Smith palette is, is six small tubes. And they last a long time. And that's really all the colors you need because you can... They mix so easily. And just having a few makes your life much easier when you're starting out and even when you're not starting out it it uh, removes some of the guesswork so you look at your color you've got mixed or the swatch you put on the table and you either if it's reddish you add a little bit of the cad red which is the warm and if it needs like a purplish tone then you add a little bit of the ultramarine blue Y'all saw me mixing those two blues. The phthalo green reads as a blue. What I'm pondering here right now is how to get that beautiful, smooth background that the photograph got. I guess you could get it if you painted the beautiful background first <laughs> and then cut out a leaf and paste it on top of it. But that's not our goal here today. And I usually jump into a painting 
and make my decisions as I go. I really want that smooth transition. I've got my um, sketchbook tilted up on another journal. In theory, the wash would, if you're holding it like this, the darker paint would travel to the wetter areas and make its own blend, but you've just got those two little spots on the sides where, you know, where the pigment can travel. And so what I'm doing here is trying to fix that, and it's not going to be the best solution. Another solution is that you can use masking fluid, which is similar to rubber cement, and you can paint that. It's a latex product. You can paint that over where the leaf would be. And I'm looking right now at somebody who missed the drawing pretty badly. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, anytime you do that, and depending on the paper you're using, I mentioned earlier that this was probably a cellulose paper. It grabs pigment and ink alike, and it grabs it, soaks it up, and you can't get it up. If you're on real watercolor paper, you can use a brush, wet it with clean water, wet the area you want to remove, and then blot it with a clean towel. Watercolor paper artist quality paper is sized which means it has a coating sometimes in the middle sometimes in the uh, manufacturing process and sometimes in the on the uh, outer after the paper is dried then on the outer top and bottom and this keeps the paint from soaking into the paper immediately so that you've got a little bit of open time if you want to blot some of it up. And that's the issue I'm facing here right now. Is that my paper is soaking up my paint almost as soon as I put it down. <clears throat> so we'll see what I decide to do. I'm mixing a yellow ochre color with uh, lemon yellow, cad lemon, and cad yellow. Two different colors there. The lemon yellow leans toward green and the cad yellow leans toward red, the cadmium red that it's sitting next to. <clears throat> the cool red in the middle of the top row is a loser in crimson, permanent a loser in crimson. And that one, you see how dark it is. It leans toward blues. So that's that makes it the cool red. I went straight in here with the main color of the leaf with this kind of orangey, yellowy mixture. Inanimate objects, your drawing is not as important as it is with a portrait or a face or, say, an architectural building that kind of needs to have straight lines and eyes and noses in the right place. But this is an inanimate object, and there are no two alike, so you can take a little artistic freedom there. I'm using my 100% organic. Uh, bird's eye diaper, 100% cotton. I get those from Amazon and just use them in the studio. And try to just use them for watercolor or water media. That would include gouache. Um, and then when they get nasty, I just throw them in the washer with some dark clothes and keep using it.
here I have obviously decided to take a detour from the photograph and add some yellow to the lightest color at the top and the darkest color at the bottom. If you try to do this, make sure that your paper is still wet enough to handle it without bleeding into the drier areas of the paper. Does it matter? Not one whit does it matter. This is your sketchbook and here I'm mixing uh, some alizarin with some cad red. This will make this will get you started on a dark brown and then coming back in with some of the cad yellow. Pretty good brown right there. Now I just lightened that dark brown a little bit with some water and add a little more red up in the top because I'm building my color layer by layer. So you start off in watercolor with your lightest layers first. And as I put this on, the leaf, the first color is fairly dry. If you'll notice how those, the top, the next color, the brownish color is staying where I put it which means that the bottom layer is drier now it's fine if you want to do that but be real careful that you don't get hard edges so paint a little bit and then soften those edges you soften them with clean water and uh, just run that brush with clean water right up underneath the wet area and the pigment will flow down into the new wet area. The color that I mixed is really close to a burnt sienna. My first tutors were big time plain air painters and they believed in limited palettes and neither one of them had any earth colors on their palette. They believed in mixing it. <clears throat> And if you've ever carried plain air gear across cobblestones up and down hills in Italy, you'll be thankful for every ounce that you don't have to carry. I could paint all day with these six colors. And maybe a little white gouache. Gouache is an opaque watercolor, which means it's designed to not be transparent. When they grind the pigments, each color, number one, has its own special grind. And number two, in general, the um, gouache pigments are ground coarser. And those little tiny chips of rock that you can't see, like mica, hit the light when you've painted. They, they hit the light on your paper. And how big the, pig, the granule is depends on how much light is pop back to the viewer from the paper. So the smaller the granule, the more the light can go around the granule and bounce off the white of the paper. I know that's too much chemistry. but And then of course you can lighten gouache by how much water you add to it. But gouache is designed to be a body color, which means solid, you know, totally opaque color. It was used well, one of the modern uses <clears throat> was for illustration work for magazines back before photography was even easy. The illustrators, say like for a newspaper, would paint their, well not newspaper, let's say, because they didn't have color, um, for a magazine. If they wanted to show a particular dress or something like in a Vogue, they would have the illustrator copy that dress in... Uh, opaque color and then they would 
uh, photograph it, the painting, and use it that way. So they wanted flat color, no shine whatsoever, because then you don't have to worry about reflections. And um, a lot of the, quote, designer squash, unquote, <clears throat> is not necessarily light fast, because those paintings were photographed and then put on a shelf somewhere, so they weren't used for fine art. But now we have fine art gouache, so you can use it comfortably with any kind of a painting you want to sell or frame. I'm making sure that my edges are soft. I don't want any hard edges until I get to the details. I'm using my brush, if I squeeze it dry or blot it on a towel and then go back into the leaf, I can pick up the color I just put on there. And that gives you a different color tone. Repetition with variation. I found this on the web. Siri just found repetition with variation for me on the web. Thank you, Siri. This is just kind of a dance. Um, this is the speed that most watercolor artists paint with. It's not a down and dirty, slam bam, thank you ma'am kind of thing. It's uh, it's deliberate, and it's slow, and it's very enjoyable. And sure, there are stages in the beginning where you might want to be a little more free with your color, but I'm looking for the dappled look that the original leaf has. Each layer is important. Number one, you'll see my burnt sienna color. We see through it to the yellow. And then you'll see areas that are straight yellow in the background. And so it's a mixture. Just helps you get more variation with your color tones and your color hues. Now I'm speckling a little with the burnt sienna color. I've loaded the brush and then I'm hit tapping it on my finger. I can control it fine that way. There are other people who take their finger and hit the brush. So just whatever floats your boat. And there are tools. You've got, got brushes that will make spatters. But you know what? When you're in the thick of painting somewhere, the the fewer tools that you use, the happier you're going to be because you don't have to dig into your art bag or go look it up on a shelf or look for it to find the perfect tool if you can use what you've already got, which is your finger. And don't let me kid you, I love toys too. <laughs> New new gimmicks. Oh my god, with that brush I'll paint the perfect paintings. Mm, doesn't work that way. But I've sure got some pretty brushes. Easing up on those dark edges at the tips. Not doing anything too fast. beginning to feel my way around some of the lines. You can also start a line by leaving the original yellow show and paint the background in the burnt sienna so that you leave yourself a, a light streak. And then you can come back and put your dark in there with a thinner line
and have a more believable rendition of belief. Feeling it to see if it's cool. If it's cool, it's still a little damp. Um, and, you know, a lot of times you can come back in when it's at that point. But sometimes the dampness, even the slightest dampness, can cause your pigment to uh, feather out on you. I'm drawing my first lines. And the lines are not continuous. And they're not the same color. So skip some areas when you're doing your lines. It's also a good idea to vary the thickness. So you've got skips and you've got thick and thin. You've got disappeared. Painting lines and things like this can be done with um, a small piece of a credit card. You could come in here with a the end of a paintbrush and just put pressure where you want the lines. And if your paper is damp enough, it will collect pigment in those indentions from your brush and it will pool make your lines. So that's another way you can do it. They make special brushes called liner brushes, but if you've got a good point on your brush, which you won't get with a craft watercolor brush, but a natural or one of the ones I told you about, the synthetic, um, will come to enough of a point that you can get very thin lines with them. Takes a little practice. See how slow I'm going? And leaves that have fallen are starting to decay, so they'll have dark spots on them. Or lacy spots, maybe, where an insect got a hold of them. You will never get the glow that that photograph has because that electronic image is being backlit to appear. And that backlit is extremely hard to emulate because we're talking ground up rocks on a piece of white paper and the white paper is that backlit that you see on the photo. So, you know, doesn't take too much to figure that out. But, you would also don't exhibit the photograph with the painting.
if you want light highlights or light spots you can actually take an exacto knife or a pocket knife and cut scratch the paper a little bit again easier with real water I mean with artist quality water paper watercolor paper because there'll be some white underneath it Above all, you have to let yourself go. You have to quit being a perfectionist. Um, you're not Betty Crocker in the art studio. Um, nobody's going to complain about how it tastes. This is your world, and this is for you to enjoy. And when you can get to the point that you can do what I'm doing right here and just let yourself disappear into the process, You'll come out of that relaxed because your your soul has allowed your brain to relax because it's busy watching what you're doing on this painting. And that's what I call the Zen zone, and that's the part where the healing takes place. It's hard to be mad at your significant other while you're painting like this and have it turn out good. You just you just can't. And then once you're finished with the painting you'll find that your mind is a little bit clearer maybe you lost some of that anger along the way or you realized it really wasn't that important there are good photographs and there are not so good photographs for painting the one that I'm following here is obviously a studio setup and the lighting is consistent over the whole leaf. That's why it looks like it's been cut out and pasted on. Where what I'm doing or attempting to do with the photograph is to the the leaf is blending to the background. Looking a little bit more like it was laying on the ground rather than su suspended in air. And if you're doing your own photography, maybe you found a leaf, don't put too much light on it. Your best if you could take it with just one light source, not two or three. In other words, you don't want the same amount of light on the left as on the right. Um, because that takes away from the form of the leaf. Or think about painting a face. You don't want to set a lamp up on the left and a lamp up on the right. You want one or the other. You want the shadows that that one light can handle or can expose. Coming back in with some pure lemon yellow. Working on those lights like I explained. So now I'm going to start on a painting using Fabriano Artistico paper, which is one of my favorites. Um, I like arches too, but um, this one, I've got a back stock of it, so I use it. Um, this is artist quality paper. It's 140 pound cold press. Cold press means that it's got some texture to it. Hot press paper means it's pressed hot while it's drying, and that makes no texture 
and then there's rough and that doesn't have any press at all it has the biggest texture the same thing I'm doing the same painting I do that a lot and then sometimes I'll turn around and paint the same one in oil or soft pastel because to me it's a challenge to see how effective or how changing a medium that you're working with can change the end result of your project but that's me I'm sometimes a mad scientist I'm taking a little bit more care with the drawing on this one things in nature are not perfect they are asymmetrical they have defects they no two are like kind of like snowflakes There are a hundred different ways to approach painting. <coughs> That's why you'll see me do one way one time and another way another. By having my uh, paper tilted, see where the water and the pigment are beating up at the bottom of the color. <coughs> That's about my favorite way to work and sometimes I paint watercolor with the tilt being a little bit more toward vertical because that droplet right there is still usable you pick it up and carry it on down to the bottom <coughs> it's just another way of doing it That's called a bead of water. And it's a way to get a, uh, a smooth gradation from one area to another. Because it keeps the paint from forming a hard edge where you stop. This time I started with the leaf first because the background on the first one was problematic. Adding water. and dry it. I'm mixing up my background color, adding a lot of water. I'm using some of the phthalo blue which gave me a greenish cast, which is fine. I mean it can be anything you want it to be. It works in this particular case because orange and blue are opposites on the color wheel, which mean they have the most uh, the most contrast, let's say. I dried that a bit. <clears throat> Uh, I don't know if I dried it enough, but we'll see. 
Now, I rarely, I try to load my brush and then leave it on there for as long as I can. And I'm seeing if I can keep the blue and the gold from mixing too much so that it, I won't have a green on the edge of the This mixture is a little bit greener than what I used before. See how the darker color is flowing down, so my lighter color right now is at the bottom. But it's even. When you're doing a wash, make sure that you have made more than enough. Because you don't really want to have to stop this process and mix more. Because A, you'll never match it, and B, your paper is going to dry the whole time you're gone. So. Now I'm coming in with just water on my brush. Trying again to get that smooth gradation that the photograph has. Just a little bit of color. See, I want that dark color to start moving down, but not too quickly, because I want a mid-tone. And it's kind of hard to do because your the leaf is not giving you areas that can do that. So you kind of have to add some darker color or the more medium color that you want to the inside edges of that leaf right there where I'm painting. Just add a little more pigment. Helping it along. A spray bottle will also help with that. You might want to hold a piece of paper over your leaf when you do that. Again, a million different ways to do it. Now the darker color C is flowing downhill. So what you'll need to do in that case is as it comes down to the edge of the paper, you want it to come off. If you do not take it off, that wet bead of paper and pigment, I mean paint and water, is wetter than the paper above it. So the wetter one will push into the drier area. And you're left with what's called blooms or blossoms. I kind of like them. I think they're fun. But it depends on what kind of an outcome you want. See how the on the left, under that, on that left point, where the wetter top area is flowing down into the little bit drier dark area? That's what I'm talking about. It will just move that pigment out of the way. Now I'm beginning to get to the point where it's too dry to touch. Too dry to mess with, I should say.
And if you get too dry, I mean, if you get to a point where the paper is too dry, leave it alone. Or if you like where the pigments are laying, go ahead and dry it with a hair dryer. And when you get it bone dry, then you can come back in and continue to work on your wash. And that is what I should have done here because I got some darker streaky areas. But that's okay. I'll keep coming in and adding darker paint to those areas and they're not moving because the paper is not as wet. See, I just noticed that white spot right there. And try as I might, I cannot cover it up. Like I said, it's okay. It's still there. And I am getting, I did end up with blossoms over on that right hand edge where I kept messing with it. So I'm going to show you a picture of this painting down toward the end so you'll know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm doing there. It looks like I'm measuring but for why I don't know. Obviously thought y'all needed to. Okay, now we're mixing up brown again. A little bit of that green. And voila. You have a brown. That's also how I mix black, by the way. I use my three primaries, yellow, red, and blue. The darker versions of them. The Thalo works. Pick my brush up and leave it a little jagged. I didn't paint the veins as early on the other painting. I'm also not lifting it up too much, am I? They're kind of continuous. Resist the urge to make both sides the same. Making my brown a little redder now. So you can just keep adjusting your color with every brush stroke if you wanted to.
by not giving you a fast forward version of this you're able to see in real time the deliberateness of what I'm painting of course you can fast forward yourself by yourself I mean on your own computer but a lot of times people get into painting and expect an immediate result like you get with art journaling or mixed media and here the speed of finish is not the issue it's to enjoy it I want that zen zone <clears throat> anything that's bothering you if you'll pick up something like this and really focus on what you're doing, you'll forget about your trauma. That's why I started painting after my daughter died. I couldn't do anything, so I thought, well, might as well start something new. But I needed the, I needed the space so my heart could heal. And this distracted me enough that I could get some peace. And it doesn't matter what your trauma or your challenge is. Painting is one of the best therapies. You can cook and you can sew and you can do all that. But painting has been proven to be one of the best. When this is completely dry after this stage, one thing you can do is mix up a redder color and very light, a lot of water and very lightly glaze over the whole leaf and that'll pull up that reddish color you see in the photograph. Again, just another method. Those are tools in your toolbox, these little tips I'm throwing out. You want to <clears throat> be familiar enough with the tools in your toolbox so that when you're painting and you drift off into a zone, your muscle memory automatically knows, oh, I could glaze this and bring it up to that reddish color, or oh, I don't have to be perfect here because the, the original leaf isn't perfect. But you don't have to think about it. That's what muscle memory can do. And until you know which two colors will make a third color, you've got to spend some time mixing colors to learn that. You can't be expected to know it in the very beginning. And as far as buying a tube of paint that's already mixed for you, you shoot yourself in the foot with this kind of painting because you can't mix those colors. And by that I mean you don't know what the factory put in them to make them that color. So if you, if it's, remember when I talked about the orange and blue being the most contrasty opposites on the color wheel, if their color has orange in it and some other things and then you come along and put blue in it, you're going to get a gray color instead of a perky leaf color. So that's what premixed colors will hamper your development. Do I have any? Of course. You just have to remember to use them differently than you do a pure pigment color. These colors are one pigment only. And <clears throat> artist colors will tell you that on the back of the label. Convenience colors might have three different pigments in it. But they do have some beautiful colors. You have to be careful. Using these six colors over and over, 
gives the painting a harmonious look because it's using it's using a few colors to mix the ones you need rather than oh I need a bright Christmas red here and so you open a tube of Christmas red and guess what's going to pop off that painting the Christmas red because it's going to look out of place to everything else because my yellow layer is completely dry I can lift color up without it mixing with the yellow now, if you brush the yellow too much you can re-liquify it and then you'll end up with a blended color rather than two different colors In watercolor, you also want to leave the white of the paper untouched from time to time. I'm very carefully covering them up in this one. <laughs> I forgot that tool in my toolbox. I'm splattering again. You can splatter with two different colors, too. I'll tell you a funny story. One of my tutors, he was older when I met him, 65 or so, and kind of set in his ways not that I'm not or anything but um, his gear his plein air gear his setup that he did was the same didn't matter where he went and he had a, a hook on the bottom of his little easel he'd hang half a coke bottle that he cut in half and poked a hole in that was his water bucket and uh, there's always a group of little tittering ladies running around doing everything but painting or listening to make sure that his every whim is addressed. And this lady had the audacity to reach over him to get to the bottle of water on his easel and take it to the sink. She was going to empty it and get him fresh water. He said, no, no, bring that back. I've just about got it where I want it. He would use his dirty rinse water for his uh, speckling. <clears throat> and I don't care how many times you study with how many different tutors, they're each going to have their little <coughs> um, habits. A lot of teachers use four different buckets of water, so that they've always got two or three different stages of clean <coughs> excuse me so remember that story if you see me working with dirty rinse water I use it to speckle with just like my mentor did I've worked a lot with uh, two different water buckets and uh, one is to remain clean and the other is where you rinse your brushes off and I guarantee you within an hour both of them will be the same color and you don't have to have a gallon bucket of water you can work with water out of a bowl from the kitchen. I've probably got one now. It's a ceramic, hand thrown ceramic. It's probably five inches tall and three inches across. But that holds plenty of water. And I've got a one of those little bowls you buy at the dollar store that you, know, you bake custard in, a little tiny bowl fits perfectly in the top of it so when I'm not using it I put that glass bowl there and it helps me 
not drop electronics or pieces of paper from mixed media or something in it. When you're working in a mixed media area, you've got to make sure that everything plays nice together. I have dropped a headphone in the water, but it still worked. Lightening some areas back to the brightest yellow. Restating those lines just like I told you on the other version of this painting. Put them in, take part of it out, put part of it back. And that gives you a nice organic look. My Randy is also an artist. He doesn't slow down enough to do much of it, but he's a very intuitive artist. I want to know why, and I want to know who does it, and I want to know why again. And while I'm worrying about the why and the how, he's over there painting something that he dreamed, and he's done. He's in and out of it in an hour. He did that in France once. We were there with a small group of people, all ladies. And they sat out and sat up outside in the sun in the courtyard by a rose bush. And they were all hunkered down, working ever so hard at that rose. Well, as the sun came out, the rose started opening. And so they were constantly trying to keep up with the light changes with the painting they started three hours before. At most, you have an hour, hour and a half outside before your scene changes or the light changes. Randy plopped himself down there. I said, oh, don't you dare. And he said, well, I'm going to go paint it. So he went in 30 minutes had painted a perfectly fresh little rosebud, uh, fresh in that it wasn't overworked. And he did it and then went to the market with Jerome to look for bicycle parts. So <laughs> that's the way he paints. We are just about finished with this little painting. And then I'm going to show you the two side by side. Now she's going to go back in with a thin cad red. That's my warm red. And I think I mixed right on top of whatever yellow was left in that pot. See? What did I tell you? She's glazing. Look at that. Had to make sure it's dry. See how the color changes when you go over the just the base coat over putting the uh, I almost said rinse the uh, glaze over the both layers the brownish and the yellowish it's a different color.
just a little bit of trivia there I thought you might enjoy. I'm joining some of those darker areas so it doesn't look splotchy. Making sure my edges are soft. I am very tickled that y'all came to watch me paint. And I hope you picked up a few tips along the way. And I will see you next week with another Dr. V adventure.